on LinkedIn, you put your, your title as an ethical hacker. Right. Can you please tell us what this is? Sure. So an ethical hacker is basically a cybersecurity professional that gets hired legally by mm-hmm. a company that allows them to legally hack their systems and try to find all the holes before the bad guys turn their lives upside down. So the difference between a, a, we'll say a malicious hacker and an ethical hacker is that we have written permission, written authorization from the customer to say, yes, go and hack me. Okay. And, that, and, and we promise not to send the police after you. <laughs> and then they pay you the big bucks to do that. They try to, yeah. Well, they try to. That's <laughs> Actually, when it's too late, they pay, that's when they pay the bigger bucks when it's too late. Ah, I understand. And how do you help them? Let's say, let's say it's too late and now they call you. You get the call. What yeah. do you do? Okay, so we have a team of what's called incident responders. Mm-hmm. It's where we come in and we work with, uh, they're called breach coaches, mm-hmm. uh, cyber insurance companies, lawyers. And usually when we, when we get called in, for, for a data breach or a ransomware, mm-hmm. it gets really, really expensive very quickly. Okay. Like, like the amounts of hundreds of thousands of dollars in a month. I can, it can go that fast. How? Well, well, because what happens is, so say you need to come, say you're a company of uh, 100 employees. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, well, what would happen is, is that say they get infected with what's called a ransomware. A ransomware is basically a, a malicious software that, that gets that gets, uh, gets sent into a company and somebody yeah. clicked on a link they're not supposed to or loaded up the program and, and it encrypts all of the data in the company. It mm-hmm. locks it up. It's completely unusable. And the only way to get this data back is if you restore from backup, which is also encrypted, yeah. or pay the ransom. And the ransom alone could be $100,000 to a million dollars. Wow. That much, eh? Oh, yeah. And uh, so say you don't want to go that route. You mm-hmm. want to try and recover your data on your own. Well, you're paying your, your IT department around the clock because you're actually down for one, over 100 hours. And then you got lawyers involved and these, and these cyber responders can go anywhere between $250 an hour to $500 an hour times That's 100 cool. hours Wow. per person. Wow. So it's a, so you can be you can get brought in for easily seventy five thousand dollars a week, depending okay. on the size of these these companies. Oh yeah, it goes very very quickly. So most business owners will try to avoid paying that ransom, but try to re- recuperate their data instead. That's right. But in some cases, they have no choice because the data maybe their last known good backup because they never tested it mm-hmm. was like a month ago. Okay. Or in some cases, a year and a half ago, we've had cases like that. They had no choice to pay the ransom. And um, so that, that's the biggest problem. Companies don't, that's in my opinion, they don't really see the need for cybersecurity until it's too late. But let's say they pay the ransom. Can the hacker come back again and say, give me more money? Isn't that how it would work? So what they would typically do is, so they have a reputation to uphold as well, right? So when you're, when you're trying to negotiate with the, with, the, with the malicious hackers, they might come down from $100,000, let's say, to sixty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and so what happens? You're gonna pay the ransom in a form of bit of Bitcoin, which is untraceable currency, mm-hmm. and they're gonna send you a special key, an unlock key that would unlock all of your data. And once that happens, there's no stopping them from hitting you again okay. at a later time, because they know, oh, th- these guys, these guys can pay the money. Yes. Hit them again. Yeah, for sure. So, so that's where, that's where like in my specialty, we, it's called um, intrusion tests. It's where we come in and play the role of a malicious hacker mm-hmm. and try to find the holes before the bad guys do. Well, that sounds really interesting. It's like a, an action movie right there, a oh. kidnapping happening and uh, they call you to save the day. The Hollywood story. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, it's not, that's why I take this knowledge because a lot of companies, a lot of people that, that work from home, they think, oh, no, I'm an individual. No one's going to want to hack me. Mm-hmm. But the individual is one of the biggest targets too because if their computers at home get locked up, they may ask for you know, a couple, $500. Mm-hmm. So uh, the hackers know that you probably have $500 to spare instead of losing all your family photos, your income tax returns, all the special, all your, 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 your sensitive data, you know? But how, so right now we know because of COVID-19, the crisis happening, a lot of people are working from home. We know the scams, the scams have gone through the roof and the percentage of people right now working from home also has increased. 
Right. What are the type you talked? You just talked about the uh, ransomware. What other scams are you seeing right now that has gone up? There's a couple of COVID ones going around. Mm -hmm. The biggest one right at the moment is the um, the Red Cross donation. Red Cross. So you might receive an email, or most of the time it's a text message that's going to come through saying, "Hey, we need your help. Donate some money." Mm -hmm. And you're going to click on the link, and you're going to enter your credit card information, and then the, the scammers will now charge your credit card and buy other stuff online with it. Okay. Uh, we've seen other cases where, um, here, here, here's a, here's a receipt from your from your COVID nineteen donation, and there's an attachment, okay. and they go and open it, and their computers get infected. Okay. So it, actually in the la last week and a half, I got a call from seven different companies mm -hmm. who all got a cyber problem based on one of their employees that opened up the attachment from their home computer. Wow. So it's becoming a, uh, it's a big, big problem right now. It's a mess. So clicking on the link, is that what you also call phishing? Yes. Yeah. It's a phishing email, but essentially. And how do you know that we you've been falling into the, the trap? It's very, very hard. So the new, the new scams, are really, really well done. So you gotta look for indicators. Okay. Things like, first thing you look for is the sender, the sender email, who's mm -hmm. it from? Is it someone, is it someone I know? Is it respectable? Mm -hmm. uh, am I expecting this email? And then when you look at the, the body of the email, is there a sense of urgency in there? Like, please get this done now. Okay. Or else, or else you might, uh, I, I, here's a perfect example. You're gonna receive an email from, from the government saying, yeah. hey, you're, you're um, your, um, your, 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 your government checks uh, need to be verified. Please log in to the, the government portal and make sure that your information is correct so there's no interruption in pay. And they'll, they'll log in, they'll get like, it looks like the, the official government website mm. and they'll think they're logging into it, but they're actually giving away their username and password. Wow. So there, there's, th there's, there's a lot of those types of scams going on. So they're able to clone the government website for you to enter your information in. Exactly, yeah, that takes moments to do. Okay, so what we do another two, like make sure that we're on the good website is to look to see if we have a, maybe sometimes you have a little lock up there, like is That's that right. some, okay. Yeah, and that so, the address is right. Exactly, yeah. So, but there's ways to, uh, to mimic that lock now, <laughs> just to bypass it. So uh, yeah, it's, that's what I'm saying, the scams now are getting very, very hard to detect. Oh la la, is there any hope there? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's getting worse. It's not getting any better, unfortunately. Uh, there's another one that you talked about. Uh, maybe we can talk about it later. The uh, sure. uh, the sextortion part, or sure. Okay. So now we've we've discussed the two types. So we have the phishing and then the the texting uh, part that's uh, very popular right now. Yes. And uh, what? problems you find that the companies oh you, you said you're getting a lot of calls that the people that c workers will click on the links and then they're getting uh, those problems so when you go in you're able to fix that for them i, I i'm able to pinpoint where to fix the things mm -hmm. so i don't necessarily go in and fix it myself unless they're bringing me for an additional bank of hours mm -hmm. it's a lot more time consuming plus uh, i actually work hand in hand with an it guy so a lot of people, and that's one of the problems I get also when I go and approach companies for, to, to get tested, mm -hmm. their, their biggest comment is, oh, no, I have, IT, I have an IT guy, I have it covered. Mm -hmm. but, but the misconception is that an IT guy is considered your family doctor. Would you ever ask your family doctor to perform laser eye surgery on you? Right? And most people would say no. So, so a cybersecurity specialist works hand in hand with the IT guy to help them find all the problems and then tell them how to fix it. And it would be faster for them to fix it than me because they're in it day to day. Okay. So they could be in there, here's an example. They could be in there setting up their backup strategy, mm -hmm. but I can go in there with an audit and say, oh, well, the way you've configured it, uh, we'll get this, this backup infected and encrypted with a ransomware. Okay. So we, 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 we advise them how to, how to fix it up. Okay. So now that we also have the problem, a lot of people are working from home. How can businesses protect themselves from these type of attacks right now? There's, there's, a, there's a couple of things. So one, the users have to get um, training. That's the okay. biggest one. So there's ways for us to, um, to send them what's called phishing campaigns, uh, where we purposely try to fish the users. And if they click on links they're not supposed to, it automatically brings them to a training. 
says, hey, you know, you, you've been fished. Mm -hmm. Here's why. You didn't pay attention to this. You didn't look at that. So it educates them uh, as we go along. Mm -hmm. And um, the other issue is that some parents give their computers to their kids because they want to play games. Yeah. Play games on it. And when they install these games, sometimes malicious software can get installed on it, which will get the company infected. So going back to, the, to all the calls that I've had is that some user at home clicked on something they weren't supposed to and they were VPN into the company. They were remoted into the company. So the hacker was able to get in through their personal computer at home into the company and steal money. So do you suggest that they have, they install whatever system is at work onto the employee's computer? That could be, be better, more expensive. Yeah, it'd be better if the, if the, if the company provided you like a, a hardened version of their computers mm -hmm. uh, versus you using your personal computer at home because you never know who's on your network, right? Could it be a hacker that's also on there? We don't know. And a lot of companies don't have um, what's called a protection detection and response plan in place. Mm -hmm. So they think that, oh, I have a firewall, I have antivirus, and I have my, uh, my patching software is up to date and I'm safe. And it's mm -hmm. not the case because a lot of hackers can, get, can bypass this traditional security. And once they're in the network, the, the, these companies don't have technology in place to, to detect that the hacker is actually there. And that's why there's hackers in your system for six to 12 months or 18 months prior to being detected. And so, so if you have a detection system in place, now do you have a response plan to get the hacker out? And if he wasn't there, what did he take? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of investigation that goes on after that. So with you, that's something you also provide business owners. Right. Okay. Exactly. So you talk, you call it the protection, no protection, uh, yeah, detection, protection, detection and response, response. plan. Yeah. Wow. Because the person could be like following you for 18 months and you, you don't even know. And yeah. And, they, that, and that's what the, it's, so it's, it's basically, um, it could be, it could be the mafia. It could be, or it's all kinds of organized crime now. Right. Because mm -hmm. back in the day, they used to be heavily involved in prostitution and drug dealing. Right. Yeah. But, but think how much, think how much effort is required to become a drug dealer. You got to go overseas, find a, a, a manufacturer, and then try to bring it back to your country. And during that time, it can be lost at sea. There's security sniffer dogs. You got to worry mm -hmm. about not getting killed. Like there's a lot of risk. And it's easier for them now to hide behind a, a VPN, which allows them to hide their tracks, hack a system, and stay undetected for months and years and just pulling out data and selling it on a dark web, untraceable. So, so that's, where, that's where everything's headed right now. So it seems obvious that bigger companies would have the capital like, to invest in a big IT system, the, the security system, to be able to hire somebody like you to help them out. What about the small business owner that doesn't have all that money to invest? How, right. What steps can they take? In that case. Also, just, to, just for your comment, there's a misconception about the big guys implementing a lot of cybersecurity. They don't often do it. They're still missing a lot of stuff. They could be installing a system that, that detects that a hacker's there, uh -huh. but because there's nobody watching the system, it's just collecting detection data. And then five months later, oh man, we got hacked. And we go back in the system. <laughs> oh yeah, it happened uh, five months ago. Like, well, that didn't help you. So, so the big guys have it in place, but not, not necessarily watching it. And the small and medium-sized businesses don't even have it at all, mm -hmm. right? They're saying, who's going to want to hack me? I'm too small. I have nothing of value. Yes. But the, that's always the, the, the comment. But they don't understand that, that they actually are the number one target. Okay, why so? So hackers are going to get into their system because they know that they have no budget, resources, or time to look into cybersecurity. So they're going to hack them and use them as a jump point to attack another company. Okay. And hide their tracks. So this way, when, when law enforcement or, or the forensic investigators look at who did this, it's going to point back to their company. And then they're going to be hit with lawsuits. Really? Lawyers are getting involved. It's going to get pretty pricey. So you mean like they make it seem as if it's the smaller company that attacked the, the, the big one? Oh, yes. wow. Yeah. And because they don't have all of their, it's called log information. Mm -hmm. right? They're not going to keep all this information in-house. So the, the investigators will look at it. They're going to say there's no logs. Prove to me, Kathy, it wasn't your company. Prove it. <laughs> you can't because you don't have the logs. I was watching one of their videos. You talked about the cyber insurance. Is that, is that what this is? That, that would be something like that? Yeah. They, so most companies should be looking at into cyber insurance now. 
uh, because there's no, it's not a matter of if you're going to get hacked, it's when you're going to get hacked. Okay. Because the users are the weakest link. It, it, it can even happen to me, mm-hmm. right? One, one wrong move and we're done. But there are things you can put in place to make it harder for the hacker to get in. And that's the goal of this thing. There's no silver bullet to stop a hacker. Mm-hmm. The goal is to make it as hard as possible for him to get in. And um, so at least with the cyber insurance, it covers some of the cost. So for example, if you did get breached mm-hmm. uh, and it, it cost you a quarter million dollars to do this investigation, well, that would pr- most of it would be covered by the cyber insurance. Wow. And what are the steps that the business, the small business owner can take? So like, let's say they have no idea about this. Now they, they're watching you saying all these things, uh, the consequences if they don't put some kind of protection in place. What, what's step one? What do we do? Okay, so the first thing we got to do is an audit. The, okay. the number one problem that I've seen in all these companies, I've, I've done close to 30 audits this year, not one of them passed. Okay. So what happens is, is that usually they have old user accounts that are still lying around in the system. Uh, I've seen cases where this user logged in recently, but then they say, hey, wait a minute, this person hasn't been with us for three years. Wow. And then we find out her password was on the dark web. So hackers may have gotten in through that account. Uh, We see a ton of misconfigured systems uh, or systems that are not patched up properly. Means they don't have the latest critical updates installed. Mm -hmm. And uh, because they don't have these updates installed, um, viruses can get into them. Mm -hmm. Um, We see things like um, the firewalls are not blocking specific websites. So mm-hmm. we're doing the audit. We do a test where can these websites go and visit entertainment sites? Can they visit pornography sites? Can they visit inter- uh, social media sites? Because these are all channels that would allow malicious software to get yes. in. Yes. Yes. So the audit will reveal all of that. It would reveal all that. Yeah. And it gives okay. us a little risk score as to the likelihood of you getting hacked. Okay. And so go ahead. There's, go ahead. Even, there's even another thing where uh, one, of, one of our audits, we call it the, the cybersecurity blood test. It's where, you know, you have, we all have this stubborn relative that never wants to see his doctor, right? Everything's always fine with him all the time. So as a doctor, it's like, okay, let me just take your blood. Let me just show you something. And that's where this report card can come in and say, look, you have all of these um, green, green means great, yellow, red, red is bad. Mm-hmm. You're missing all these things. So there's ways for us to show you like a cyber blood test report of what's going on in your company. And it's very, very inexpensive. Oh really? Yeah. So, what, for example, we can we can get started at all uh, at, at just under a thousand dollars. Okay, good. Because that's even that's less expensive compared to all the lawsuit that can we can. Uh, oh my God! Yeah. Slap us to. Right? But this is just a start, right? This is just a starting point. Yes, of course. But it's a way to start off without breaking the bank. And, okay. and another issue, um, another issue we find sometimes is um, we call it a an anomalous login report. It's where Kathy usually logs in nine to five. Mm-hmm. And now she's logging in at 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. And that's not, that, that, might, that might not be normal. So we have to investigate what's her account compromised or things like that. So, but, now, but we have a challenge right now because with the COVID stuff happening, these users can log in whenever they want. Mm-hmm. So I'm receiving a lot of false alarms at the moment where I'm seeing users logging in at midnight, um, they're logging on, on unauthorized networks, which is their Wi-Fi's. Yes. So I'm getting a lot of alerts that I got to triage better. So would you say, or would you suggest that, so the Wi-Fi for the business or that they have to make sure their employees' uh, Wi-Fi is secure, or at least explain to them how to do so? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, in, in what happens usually is that uh, they like to go to these these open the Wi-Fi cafes like, like Starbucks, for example. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing stopping me from bringing my laptop to Starbucks and loading a, a special software in a device called a Wi-Fi pineapple and, and create Starbucks fast Wi-Fi. <laughs> People are going to say, well, I want faster. So they're going to connect to me. And what happens is when they connect to my Wi-Fi, I can intercept their traffic. And sometimes okay. if their systems are not properly secured, I can decode their, their passwords. Uh, and I might be able to hack them over as well. What about at home? Isn't it secure to begin with? Is it just the password? Is there something extra that can be done? Well, I often still see uh, Wi-Fi that have the default settings set up as if they just bought it from Best Buy. 
So yeah. they set it up and the username is admin, password admin, or no password. And then once I'm in the system, I'd be able to talk to whatever computers are active inside the house. And I can snoop on what everybody's doing. And I can even what's called redirect them. So if, they, if they're going to rbc.com, for example, mm-hmm. I, I can make them go to rbcbanking.ru, Russia. Yeah. And they won't even pay attention and they're going to sign in and they're going to give me their username and password, their client card number and password. What about things like, that's very common because I remember I worked in the past with a company and I think the manager said, oh, just download the AVG free uh, antivirus. Yeah. What is the difference between the paid one and the free version? Okay. So a lot of people, I, I see a lot of in small businesses as well. Yeah, I got AVG free. It's good. But there, there's, there's, there's not enough protection to stop mm-hmm. today's hackers in, the, in, the, in the, the free version. Even the paid version is not, uh, it, it needs some work, right? You need additional softwares to help protect you. So the difference between the, the free and the paid is that when you download the free, mm-hmm. they, 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 they hide some features from you, right? Yes. But what happens is they solicit your feedback about what you like, don't like, uh, maybe like um, performance uh, st- st- statistics from your computer. And they take all of this information and make it better into the, into the paid version. So they, they take all your feedback and, and make it better and put it in the paid version. So this way um, you, you, you'll you end up sp- spending it on, on the paid version. So it's going to be more advanced. So could the paid version also tell us that somebody has been, uh, who's been hacked or are they very good at this or not really? Not really. The, the traditional antiviruses aren't as effective as they used to. Now we need more advanced software like behavioral analysis software, like uh, like a malware bites. Uh, or if you're, if you're a company, you look at the bigger stuff called CrowdStrike. But these softwares cost $10,000. Okay. But, it's, but it's very, very, very highly effective against cybercrime. In fact, actually, they even put a, a, a breach warranty on it that if you get hacked, we'll pay the first million dollars to clean this up. Wow. Yeah. So if I do a little summary here, so I'm a small business owner. So you tell me the first thing I have to do is an audit. Yeah. Make sure my Wi-Fi is protected, not the default system. And also the, the type of uh, antivirus that I have, it has to be also looking good. What about the cloud where I save my uh, personal information, Dropbox and other ones out there? Is right. that really safe? No, because here's what happens also is that we're seeing a lot of um, companies where their, their employees are saving their, 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 their work into a Google Drive or an I, iCloud. Mm-hmm. And what's happening is now is they've taken the, the sensitive data outside of the company and put it into the cloud, into the general public. And um, there's not an easy way for the IT department to see that they've done that. Okay. So the only way is, the best way is to, is to really block all that off. Um, I could talk about some other issues that we're seeing in, inside the company. So like, the, like we'll call it the top 10, the top 10 issues. The, um, the other one is software. I see a lot of companies that still have windows XP and windows seven running in there. And a lot of times it's not their fault because they can't, they have, let's say they have, they have uh, security software that controls the door security for their office. Well, yes. that might not run on windows 10. It only mm-hmm. runs on XP. So they're stuck with that outdated unsupported software. And then if it's not set up properly, we go in there and breach it in 30 seconds. For sure. So what is your message, uh, Terry, for small business owners? What would you tell them during this crisis, that, COVID-19 here? That right now, they're, they are the number one target that's, that's, uh, that's being looked at right now because mm-hmm. they know that you don't have the resources, the, the budget, or even the time to look into cybersecurity. Yeah. So they're going to leverage you to hide their tracks inside your company and hold you hostage for these types of uh, scams, like ransomware scams. We'll talk about the sextortion scam, right? Mm -hmm. The sextortion scam is basically where you received an email saying, hey, Kathy, you don't know me, but your password is this. And it's your real password. You're probably freaking out. Like, how how did the guy get my password? And it says, I've got video of you on an adult website. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay me in Bitcoin, I'm going to share this video to all your contacts. I've had customers in the past that actually... We're really, really upset. We're really, really nervous about this because it could be lawyers, doctors yeah. that have very, very, they have a very high profile and their, their client list is very sensitive. 
and their reputation would be at risk. Yes, for sure. So I know that it's a scam. There's a good chance nothing happened to their machines, but they still want me to come in and do, a, do an investigation or a cleanup or fine tuning and all that stuff. But the way it's done is your password was used on a website that got hacked and all the database got cracked. Okay. So if you've got a bad password that's linked to your Kathy email, it's going to send you the link saying, hey, this is your password and pay me. So some people will say, oh my God, it's my real password. Or some will say, well, this is weird. It's a password I used seven years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't use it How'd they get this? So you're able to help them not to be fallen victim of, the, of this? Is, is... Yeah, well, it's hard to do that because once you give out your data to Facebook or LinkedIn or these other websites, you no longer, you no longer control that data. Mm -hmm. So if LinkedIn got hacked like they did a couple of years ago, yes. they're in the process of, of decrypting all of those passwords right now and trying to scam everybody. So I can't protect LinkedIn, right? They have their own security system. No, but so, I mean your client, do they have to pay? Is it for real? Do... Most of the time it's not for real. Okay. It's because they've used that method. So the scammers are just out there. They're, they're, they're fishing for money. And a lot of times they don't even know you got hit. And they just, they wake up one morning, oh, a million dollars show up in my account. <laughs> you know, or a couple of, a couple of grand. So oh, that's goodness. the thing with the business owners. They, uh, they, they have to not put so much trust in their IT department because a lot of times they, especially when I do these presentations and live events about how it's done and I show them real, real life demonstration, they're like, they're like freaking out after the show saying, hey, I was texting my IT guy to make sure we have it covered. And then I have phone calls with them and we, un and we uncover that it's not necessarily the case. They're not actually up to date or they are missing things. So they come in with, a, I come in with an audit and uh, I open their eyes on some stuff. Because the IT guy doesn't quite, I don't know, maybe is not looking at these things or... They're not trained. Not trained right? the IT, So, so the, it's like going, going back to your family doctor analogy. Yeah. You know, he's, he's a general physician. He knows a little about a lot. But with the cybersecurity guys, we're specialized in either in hacking or forensics, whatever division we're going to be in. But we're specialized. Yes. And, but, the, but again, we complement each other because... Uh, IT and IT security is such a huge bubble yes. that some people think we do it all, including the, the, the presidents of the company. Oh yeah, I have an IT guy. He does everything, but it's not, it's not true. So we, we all complement each other in certain ways. I understand. So I think we can segue into the family, uh, how parents can also protect their household and their kids when it comes to cyber uh, attacks. Sure. Cyber attacks with their kids. <laughs> yes. Cyber right there. So, well, let's take the scenario of COVID-19 again. Parents now have their personal laptop. The kids are also using it and they're also using it for work. And the kids are downloading video games and things like that. Tell, t elaborate on the subject. So, so there, there, there's, there's two ways to have your computer at home. Either, either the office gave you the computer, mm -hmm. which will hopefully be locked down. Yeah. Which means you have no administrative access on it, mm -hmm. which should mean that you have no access to install games or even mm -hmm. applications onto it. It should be locked down. The other one, which is very common, is that uh, we don't have enough computers to give you. Please use your personal computer. We'll provide you a VPN access to come in. Mm -hmm. That is the most dangerous one because they have too much access on the computer. They're set up as an administrator. And this is a, you know, just a side note. People will say, well, I have a Mac, so I'm safe versus a PC. And there's some truth to that. So when you okay. have a Mac, you are actually set up as a normal standard user, which means mm -hmm. you have no access to install applications unless you type in the master password, mm -hmm. right? Whereas Windows, you have full access, but you have to lock it down yourself. Okay. So there's ways to, to, to go from an administrator account to a standard user account, just like a Mac. Mm -hmm. But most people don't do that. So they're set up as admin with no password. And, um, and then once they click on something they're not supposed to, they just hit yes, and then pff, game over. Then their computers are infected. They have no way of detecting that something's going on. And if they're remoted into the, into the office, the hacker can also see that. So there's ways for us to retrieve all of the username and passwords from your browser. Uh, we could turn on the camera without the light going on, turn on the microphone in the room, access your files, 
So if you have any private photos or uh, sensitive Word documents, we have access to all of that. Crazy. So what do the parents, what can they do? When it, when it comes to stopping hackers, you mean? Yes. There's not too much they can do. None of them, none of them are, are even trained to, to look for that stuff. They see, oh, my computer's running slow. That's, that's as much as they see. Maybe it's an old computer. We need to change it. Could be that. Or I've had cases where they'll, they'll call me up and say, my mouse is moving by itself. Is that normal? <laughs> no, it's not normal. <laughs> so they'll, they'll see that or they'll see pop-ups. There are some warning signs though. Like, like things like if your computer's running slow yeah. and it's fairly new, that could be a problem. Obviously, if your mouse is moving. That's not good. That's a very bad, very bad sign. Uh, things like... Um, uh, what else could there be? Just so much stuff. You, you have, uh, say, say you load up a browser and your default homepage that usually goes to Google. Mm -hmm. And now it changed to like ask.com or some other site on its okay. own. Well, that could be a sign that you have malicious software installed somewhere. Okay. Those so a couple of it's the same idea with the business owner with their computer is to make sure that you have good antiviruses in place. Uh, the Wi-Fi system, make sure it's good, good passwords. And uh, is, it, is there something else that I'm missing? Um, trying to think for the small, for the home guy. I mean, obviously, we wanna, the biggest problem is, is around passwords as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people create very, very weak passwords. Yes. Like John123. And uh, that is a big problem. So to, so to create an unbreakable password or we'll call it a very strong password is where you want to have between 16 and 25 characters long using yes. uppercase, lowercase, and symbols. Now, mm -hmm. A lot of people will freak out saying, are you nuts? Like how are you going to remember a password this long? Yeah. So if you can think of song lyrics or phrases, so things like I had a great day at work 2020 exclamation mm -hmm. point, right? Very simple phrase. But if you remove the spacing and capitalize each letter of the word, that password alone will take 10 years to break. Okay. And if you, if you want to make it really unbreakable, you replace the O's with a zero and the A's with an at symbol. And that'll take uh, 39 centuries to crack. But there is a thing that you need to put out on all your accounts. It's called two-step verification. Okay. Uh, or, or it's also known as two-factor authentication. This is where you're going to enter your phone number mm -hmm. into the system. And when you type in your username and password, a text message or... Uh, or it'll ask you to load the authenticator app to give them a, a six digit code, a random code to also enter the, uh, to the website. And a combination of all three will allow you to get into your account. So this way, if somebody did guess your password or got access to it, well, they wouldn't be able to get in without the text message coming to your phone. At least that would help. Exactly. But there is an issue going around right now. And I had, I had uh, a friend of mine, call me last night about it. It's called, it's called the uh, SIM swapping. It's where you got a phone with a provider. Mm -hmm. say, it's, say for example, it's with Bell. And somebody had enough information about you where they called up Bell and impersonated you and had your line transferred. Well, what now what happens is, is that when your phone gets transferred, you no longer have access to some of your accounts because the text message is going to the wrong phone now. Yes. And so this person lost access to her PayPal account, um, the bank account. Hmm. And because they're trying to send, you know, they want to verify their, their identity, right? Yes, yes, yes. So it's like, Kathy, tell me the six digit code that just arrived on your phone. Oh, I don't have my phone. It got, it got ported out. Sorry, can't help you. So, and especially now during COVID, there, there could be a six hour wait on the phone. Or they're saying, yes. well, show up in person at the bank and prove your identity while the bank is not necessarily open. So it's, it's, very, it's a very, very bad time to be a victim at this, time, at this moment. Yeah, I know somebody that got that fallen victim of, into that, uh, what you just mentioned about the phone. Yeah. So I think the steps that uh, Bell said that they had to call Equifax, uh, TransUnion to put a stop in, to anybody trying to apply a, for credit under their names exactly. and then change all the passwords altogether. Exactly. So and right now to, at this point, she's freaking out, right? Because nothing's open. It's, there's very, very long wait times. It's, it's very, very chaotic. So I'll, I'll, be doing, I'll probably be doing a, a video interview with her later on once this is over too, so she can share her experience. 
That would be very helpful for a lot of people because I'm, like you said, it's rampant right now. A lot of people must be falling victim of, uh, of that one. And they know everybody's at home. They know everybody's online, mm-hmm. right? And that's what, you know, we spoke about, um, I, was, I was interviewed recently about Zoom, all the issues that with Zoom, even though yes. it's not a security issue. I mean, there is some security issues, obviously, but most of the problems were like with Zoom bombing or people getting access to your Zoom links. Yes, yes, yes. But now they've put password trying to uh, fix that. On it. But sometimes yeah. that's not enough because if you shared, say, say you, you were doing a meeting with six people and you shared that link out and that person shared it with somebody else, well, they'll okay. be able to get onto the meeting. Mm-hmm. So there's ways that you can create what's called one-time meeting links that will self-destruct after the meeting. Or okay. you can... Or you can actually do what's called uh, a waiting room where all the people show up before the host mm-hmm. to a waiting room and you get to see the attendee list and whoever's not supposed to be there, you can kick them out. Yes, yes, yes. And then once the meeting starts, you can lock the meeting so nobody else can join. Okay. So there's little tactics you can do afterwards. So what would be your general message for, for parents right now? Um, okay. So what, for the parents, there's a couple of things. There's... Um, they need to be educated on what their kids are doing online. The, uh, right now, they're, they're supposed to be doing homework, right? They're, they're, there's some stuff they can do at school, but a lot of them are online playing games. They're doing their TikToks. Uh, God, I hate that, <laughs> TikToks. So they're, all, they're, they're, they're doing all this stuff, but they, the parents don't have a clue about who they're talking to online. So yeah. for all they know, they could be talking to a cyber predator, like, yes. like what happened in, uh, was it in Nova Scotia or somewhere in Canada. Mm-hmm. Where, um, they, uh, this, this guy was luring out kids. So the parents need to get educated on, on the technology they're using and who they're talking to. And also educate the kids of the risks that are out there. Yeah. So whenever I present in schools, mm-hmm. I, you, I usually get the, uh, the first impression is like, oh, who's this Terry Cutler idiot that's going to try and teach me something new, right? I don't need your cyber safety. And then when I show them a live demonstration of how I can track them online with nothing in their profile, right to their doorsteps, hmm. they freak out. Now, now they, they're convinced that, oh my God, I need to pay more attention to this and really protect their accounts. Because a lot of them, they don't protect their accounts either. They have bad passwords. Their, their, their YouTube accounts are being hacked over. And if you've got enough following, uh, that could be, that could be detri- detrimental to your, to your account. I know you have, you put together a course online. Yeah. Is that what you teach in the course? I do. Yeah. So, so my course is called Internet Safety University. Mm-hmm. So it now has over 26,300 students from over 160 wow. countries. I didn't even know there was 160 countries, to be honest. And uh, so in there, it allows me to pre-record my content, mm-hmm. upload it, and they can watch it at their own pace. Okay. Instead of me trying to do live events every day and, and, uh, you can't duplicate yourself. No. And that's why with this, with this, this uh, recording, it allows me to be, uh, get it done right the first time and they can watch it at their own pace. So if somebody wants to buy the course to know more about what's out there and how to protect themselves, where can they go to find that information? They can go to uh, www.internetsafetyuniversity.com. Okay. So I guess we'll put the link below for them to, uh, sure. to have access to that. Yeah. There's a couple of links. There's uh there's uh, terrycutler.com, which is my blog. That's my, that's my landing page where you can get access to me on social media, my okay. latest blogs. Uh, usually, we should, we should start there first. Okay. And then I, I, I'm putting together um, uh, like a video series now for corporate. Because okay. when, I, when, I, when I published the, uh, the book, yes. there's a part two in here that talks about cybersecurity for businesses on how to get started. And... Mm-hmm. Um, Again, the comment is like, oh, I got these IT guys. I don't, I don't need your help. But I, I walked them through the issues that their IT guys are not picking up mm-hmm. and how the hackers are getting in and why they're getting in. And, um, and I can present them an offer at the very end if they're interested. So the book is coming out on May 1st. I saw yeah. you posted that. Yes. So, it's, uh, so the official launch will be on May 1st. It's my, first, wh- uh, my first book. How long did it take you to uh, put all of this together? It's seven years in the making <laughs> and six months in the process. Wow. So it took about six months to, uh, to put this all together. So one of the reasons was I, um, 
whenever I publish videos, I usually script everything out, make sure I got okay. everything I say, what I want to say. And obviously I have that for, for all these videos and I have over a hundred videos. Okay. So I got the manuscripts for every single video, plus my blogs, plus mm-hmm. podcasts, plus live events. I, I have no shortage of content. So, but the thing is I can't just copy and paste that and put it into a book. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and plus the way I speak on video is going to be different than what's in the book. Yes. So, um, so my publisher is also working with an editor who was able to bring this book to life. And uh, it, was, it was actually surprisingly how well it was rewritten that I, it makes me want to buy my own book. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it came out well. I'm very, very proud of it. Well, I'm very happy for you. Seven it's years not, in the making. It's not what I care about, right? It's about what the public is going to say. So I'm anxious to see on May 1st uh, when, when it's available, see uh, the feedback. And... But how can people purchase it? So when they go to, um, I have a launch page that's up. It would be at um, terrycutler.com slash book. Okay. Which will redirect them to the, to the page. But it's going to be available on Amazon worldwide. So it's okay. available on international launch. Um, it's going to be available on paperback on mm-hmm. Kindle. And I'm also getting it done on Audible, on, in audio right. version. So I hired um, uh, a narrator named Kaleo Griffith. He mm-hmm. actually narrated uh, Donald Trump, The Art of the Deal book. Wow. So he's got about 75 books that he's, he's narrated. And uh, when I had my call with him, I said, look, I want my personality to come out, right? When I do videos, I try to be playful, humorous, and, and edutaining. We'll call it educational and entertaining at the same time. So he took my feedback. He, he sent me back a sample of the, the first chapter. Okay. I loved it. I said, you're hired. And, uh, but his ver- his, the audio book will only be available mid-May. Mid-May. It's a bit okay. of a backlog. How did you find this person? Um, well, I'm a, I'm a subscriber to Audible. Okay. And when I, so I bought the Art of the Deal book and a couple of other books that, where he narrated and okay. I liked his voice. So I reached out to him and said, can you do this work for me? And uh, we were able to come out uh, with a deal in uh, the Art of the Deal. <laughs> and uh, so here we are. So it's going to be available uh, mid-May on, on Audible and iTunes. Okay. Yeah. So. Big accomplishments, eh? So it's, I'm excited. It, it, now I'm an official author. Yes. I have my own ISBN number and everything. And uh, so it, it feels a bit weird to have that, <laughs> to have that title now, an official author. I'm sure it's going to be a successful book. But I had a question for you, though. Let's say somebody's watching this and they like what you do and they want to become somebody like you. Right. What are, how, how can they do that? Okay. So I get that question so many times. And I'm trying to put something together that would, that would answer this question in more general terms. Mm-hmm. So whenever I speak to, especially high school students mm. that want to get into the cybersecurity career, the cybersecurity, cybersecurity space is very, very large. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you can't just say, oh yeah, I'm a cybersecurity specialist and be a master of everything. It's impossible. So you have what's called ethical hackers You've got forensic specialists, you have incident responders, you've got policy people, you've got uh, chief information security officers, you got, you have all these divisions. Mm -hmm. And um, so you got to pick an area that you're most passionate about. Now, the misconception also about cybersecurity is that you cannot just go into cybersecurity because you want a job. You need to be passionate about this field because this field is, is very, very fast paced. It's not very rewarding. And most of the stuff we're recommending or using is not working at all. Okay. And there's no recognition. There's, yes, the money is very good, but you're going to work your ass off to, to hmm. get there, right? So um, the other challenge is that a lot, of, a lot of companies right now, they want to see three to five years of experience before they hire you. But how are you going to get that experience if you, you, you haven't even started yet? Yes. Or if you just got certified, what do you do? You can't find a job because no one's going to hire you because you have no experience. So there's a couple of things you can do. Mm-hmm. One of them is always share your knowledge. So when you, if you're taking, say, the ethical hacker track or the cybersecurity track uh, in, in professional hacking, you're always going to learn something new. So find a way to get comfortable in front of a camera or podcast, whatever, and share that knowledge with people because you never know who's listening. And they might pick you up and say, oh, I like this guy's stuff. I'm going to follow him. And eventually amasses a a large following. And you can use that on your CV. 
Okay. And, and hopefully the HR, you can, there's a way to bypass HR because somebody's going to recommend you. Mm-hmm. And a lot, of, a lot of people think, well, Terry, you must have a university level education, whatever. And they're shocked when they find out that I only have a high school leaving diploma. <laughs> so I, I never, I dropped out of college and I never went to university. Mm-hmm. But I did take specialized training when, when I came out. So mm-hmm. I said, I don't want to take calculus and all these classes I don't like. I want to learn networking. I want to learn about security. I want to learn this, this, this. This is what I want. So I, I, I did specialized courses, got certified, and then I was able to get a job fairly quickly. And how long have you been doing this for? Uh, I've done this since 1995. Wow. Yeah. So it's, uh, is that 25 years now? I have a hard time calculating. It's a lot of years. Let, let's just It's a lot of it. years. I yeah, feel it's... old. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so the, so, but there are ways to fast track your, your career mm-hmm. it's by sharing your knowledge, uh, and especially volunteering. Okay. So, you know what? I have no experience, but I'm very passionate. So if you give me a chance, give me a three to six month free pass, uh, no money. Let me just prove my worth. And that can also, uh, get you in places very quickly. So you mean go to a company and volunteer for, for free free but what, what do they say they do they want to do for them well they say well you know i i, I specialized in audits okay cyber audits for example i said let me just let me just audit you or work with your team mm-hmm. in the trust and uh and and help them okay and that, and that can work a lot of times well that's good advice right there well uh, terry it's uh, it was really good you gave us a lot of goodies to think about when it comes to the business side, you know, the parents, what they have to do, and also those who would like to get involved in the field, what are the steps uh, that they can take uh, to get started? And also your books. I'm I'm sure that there's a lot of knowledge in there that you shared on uh, different things that we have to, we we, we can learn from you. My publisher made me laugh. He's like, okay, so when are we working on book two? (laughs) Because I have so so much content that never made it into the book. Um, but for the, for, the, uh, for the company side, if they want to learn how to get started with cybersecurity, mm-hmm. I put together a little video series for them. Uh, it's at sciologylabs.com forward slash start. Start, okay. And that will walk them through the top 10 issues that almost every company is facing. Okay. Then it's going to walk them through how the hackers are getting in, mm-hmm. which I'll show them live demonstration, some real war stories of behind the scenes of, uh, of hacking and it's all in layman's terms. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to show them why the hackers are getting in because most companies protect their networks like they, like they protect their home, which doesn't work. And then at the end, if they're interested, I'll, I'll walk them through how they can get started. That's very good. What else can we ask for more? Like, and it's all free. It's all free. Well, that's, it's, that's, where, that's where I compete. I compete on value. Yes. Yes. I that's very sure important. Good. And then looking at your content on LinkedIn, YouTube, I can see that you, you give a lot uh, yeah. for free, a lot of value to your listeners. And Thanks. you're involved a lot in the community too, because I've seen you won awards uh, for this. It's, that, that was uh, one thing. I, I, so what was interesting about talking about, talk about awards. So in 2018, I was named number one most influential person in cybersecurity yeah. worldwide. And, I, and I, obviously I was honored by that. And what I love about what I love about this award is that it, it's not yeah you can vote for me all you want but mm-hmm. there's like 30 independent judges around the globe that audit your work so wow. it's not like one guy could say oh yeah Terry's gonna win well mm-hmm. the other 29 judges can say no he's not so they you, they all critique your work very very heavily and uh, they all unanimously agreed that I was number one but I find it weird because I can't even influence my kids to come to the table without an iPad. <laughs> So you, you're I'm known on, in on. the field. You're known in the field. I'm known in the field. You're an authority leader. Well, that's great, Terry. That's great. Uh, do you have any final words for the entrepreneurs that are listening to you? Uh, any encouraging uh, words despite what's happening? A lot of people have lost their jobs and a lot of businesses have been shut down. Any good words? Yeah. Okay, so this will be more of an entrepreneurial tip. Yes. For those of you that don't like your job, <laughs> <laughs> now is the perfect time to use this downtime to mm-hmm. really learn what you want to do, that you're passionate about, and take specialized training on there. There's, there's places like Udemy.com. 
Mm-hmm. Com, which have hundreds of thousands of courses of, I think, and, and it's very, very expensive starting at like 10 bucks. Um, learn about the craft that you want to learn. And then from there, switch careers or, or change your career path. Now is the time to do it while you're getting paid to stay home. 